So my name is Lorcan Butler. I'm a dispensing optician and optometrist with the Brain Tumor Charity. So my role as optical engagement manager is to engage with DOs and optometrists throughout the UK. And how to do that is by doing CPD events. So this evening's presentation is called Optic Discs Papilledema, both for optoms and DOs. It's one CPD point interactive. I've been giving this talk for approximately two years across the UK with numerous ophthalmologists and neuro-ophthalmologists, and I'd like to be able to pass on some of the clinical pearls I've learned from them to you. Um, we'll be going through some visual fields, some OCT, digital retinal camera, some signs and symptoms. Don't worry too much if you don't have an OCT, I'll be giving you plenty of clinical pearls and key take-home messages to take away at the end of this presentation. We probably have a broad church of people this evening time. We could have pre-regs, we could have DOs, we could have optoms, clinical managers, CLOs. So hopefully so you'll be able to all take something back to practice tomorrow. So I'm just going to continue with my slide deck and hopefully Shona can move on. So this may be an image you may be seeing tomorrow in your clinic. It's a digital retinal camera. You may be looking at this thinking, am I concerned about this? Are there clinical signs here that I may be able to pick out? Are there clinical signs I don't know what they are? Am I going to refer this, the urgency of referral? If you're saying yes to some of those questions, hopefully by the end of this evening's presentation, you'll be able to answer those. So what we're going to do is talk about the papilledema, then we're going to talk about pseudopapilledema, and they're going to talk about differential diagnosis and management. So why is papilledema important to me? So I work with the Brain Tumor Charity, and you may or may not know approximately a third of people with brain tumors do have visual problems. And that can be at the beginning of the journey, coming to an optometrist for a routine eye examination, and we have an incidental finding, we detect a brain tumor, they may have noticed something's wrong, and we see something, we can refer them onwards. Brain tumors can cause papilledema, and they're extremely rare. You might get one in your whole career. You might be lucky to get two or three. And most papilledema is not caused by a brain tumor. So papilledema can be caused by a brain injury, a brain abscess, a mass, a bleed, or it can also be a papilledema. Uh, so just to kind of pass on a funny comment, I got my knuckle dropped once by an ophthalmologist. I post on LinkedIn for educational content. And an ophthalmologist pulled me over the coals and said, you shouldn't be calling a papilledema until we can measure intracranial pressure. So it's always going to be suspect papilledema when you refer to an ophthalmologist in the hospital. But I think for tonight's forum and within the optometric community and dispensing optician, we're happy to say papilledema, but we're talking to an ophthalmologist, it's always going to be suspect papilledema because it can't be classified as papilledema until the intracranial pressure has been measured. So that's what papilledema is. It's a bilateral optic disc swelling secondary to a higher ICP. It can be unilateral, but it's extremely rare. And the elevation can also be asymmetric between the two optic nerves. You're never going to be two optic nerves, which are going to be symmetrical. And the important part is all patients with papilledema should be suspected to have an intracranial mass or a space occupying lesion, something inside the brain, which is not there until there's proof to the contrary. And papilledema is never a primary condition. It's always a secondary condition. So papilledema to secondary to meningitis, papilledema secondary to encephalitis, papilledema secondary to a brain trauma. And the instance is 4.5 per 100,000. Now, when I started giving this talk two years ago, that number was approximately half. It was just over two. So the instance of papilledema is increasing, and that can be linked with the increase in people who do have an increase in IIH, which we'll speak about next, and obesity. So this is probably one of the most important slides we have this evening time. So the, approximately 80% of people with papilledema will have IIH, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Now you may have come across a bit in the past as benign idio idiopathic or benign intracranial hypertension. The nomenclature has changed due to the sight-threatening and also life-threatening condition. So it does have a classical phenotype and that phenotype tends to be a young female, childbearing age with a higher than average BMI. And one of the most important things to take away from this evening's presentation is 90% of these people will be symptomatic. So I gave this presentation with uh, an, a neuro-ophthalmologist called Susan Mollen, and Susan will be the number one person in the UK who deals with ladies with IIH. And she says of all the cohort of her people coming to her, 90% will be symptomatic and also 90% will be obese. So we're going to do a check in our clinical consulting rooms. And one of the things we're going to find out is visual acuity. And something you may not know that visual acuity is not really affected in papilledema until a late stage. So you could get somebody come along for a normal eye examination. They received a, a, a referral or a, a promotional voucher in the post or a friend recommended to come along. Um, or they might, might have received us a reminder. So it could just be an incidental finding. VAs could be fine. They could be 6, 5, N5. There's no concerns. Some of the clinical papers talk about what we call a TVO, a transient visual obscuration. And this is where the vision just 
disappears. It's just a momentary loss of vision. The clinical papers refer to as a graying eyes or a dimming. And these are words you may not hear in a clinical practice. So I would just tend to kind of classify it as a loss of vision momentarily. And I'll come across this later in the presentation. And why does it happen? Due to a buildup of pressure within the optic nerve, and it puts pressure on the blood supply and a momentary loss of blood to the oxygen and oxygen. Other optic nerve functions we're going to look at and routinely check, but we may not get a response again to late stage our pupils. You may not get an OAPD onto the late stage papilledema. Color vision isn't usually affected until late stage. And here's another clinical pearl. We gave this presentation to five ophthalmologists and they all tend to use Ishihara. Not uh, saying that Ishihara is the most sensitive, but Ishihara is the one that's mostly used by ophthalmologists because of its size. It's portable. It can be used in both children and adults. And it's just trying to identify, is there a color vision defect, record baseline, and then check to see if it's increasing or decreasing every subsequent visit, whether it be a three month or six month visit. Uh, double vision, you may not know that double vision uh, can be in association with papilledema. The cranial nerve palsy six tends to be the longest cranial nerve from its point of attachment to the brain all the way to its point of attachment in the eye. So therefore it can be a bit more prone to pressure and that can pressure be direct pressure when the brain stem is pushed further down by a space occupying lesion, a mass, a tumor, or it can also be caused by indirect pressure from an increase in the intracranial pressure. So if you do see somebody with a paresis or a palsy on ocular motility, you may be thinking which extraocular muscle is affected. It could be further back in the visual pathway, what we call a false localizing lesion. So just be aware of that. And we're probably all very familiar with the very angry Kansky image we see and the image we see in the optical press of the very angry looking optic nerve head. And what I wanted to bring your attention to is just some features you may be aware of and some you may not be aware of. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the blurred, smudgy disc margins. And then we have the decrease or the absence in the C to D ratio. So papilledema is the opposite of glaucoma. In glaucoma, you get an increase in the C to D ratio. With a papilledema, we get a decrease in the C to D ratio as it gets filled with exudates. One of the true signs of a papilledema to differentiate it from other forms of optic disc edema is vessel obscuration. And this is where the vessel momentarily disappears. So if you can imagine a flat optic nerve head, the blood vessels come off the optic nerve head onto the retina quite flat. If the optic nerve head is swollen, then the blood vessel is gonna come off the optic nerve margin go down and then come back onto the retina. So you get that momentary obscuration. And this would be a true definitive sign of a papilledema. You could get hemorrhages and they can be both on disc and off disc. There may be an absence of SVP, a spontaneous venous pulsation. And this is something we'll come across later in the presentation. It does tend to have quite a contentious issue. So in theory, 80% of the population should have SVP. And when the presence of SVP is reassuring, depending when you graduated, you may have been told in college 20, 30, 40 years ago, if some somebody has SVP, they can't have papilledema. And we'll talk about this later. This is a diagrammatical feature of the obscuration of the blood vessel. So what we tend to have here is blurry disc margins. We tend to have off disc hemorrhages. But what I want to bring your attention to is the five o'clock position and seven o'clock position. This is where they get the obscuration of the blood vessel. So people always ask me, is there one definitive sign? And this tends to be the number one sign of, to compare and dis distinguish papilledema from other forms of optic disc edema. So just looking at the blood vessels as they come off the optic nerve head. And I watched a video recently with an American ophthalmologist, and he talked about looking at the blood vessels. They should be crystal clear. And that was the term he used. They should be crystal clear as they go across the optic nerve head margin. You can see that blood vessel is not crystal clear. It just disappears and then reappears again. So that's this obscuration of the blood vessels. Visual fields is again a late stage presentation. You may not get any visual field defects until a late stage papilledema. Now, everybody's visual fields are different, but in terms of the clinical papers when it comes to papilledema, we talk about the first thing, which is mechanical. So as the optic nerve head becomes elevated, then the blind spot's going to become bigger. So an enlargement of the blind spot is the first visual field uh, phenomenon to be seen. The second one then is an inferior visual field defect. So the superior aspect of the pole of the optic nerve tends to be affected primarily, and that therefore that tends to lead to an inferior visual field defect. And that can be an altitudinal visual field defect or it can be quadrantopic. And that's why uh, papilledema can sometimes mask or be a, uh, a masquerader for glaucoma because it can have a visual field defect similar to a nasal step. And I'll show you that on the next slide. And then as the papilledema uh, increases, you'll tend to find that you'll get the, an overall constriction of the peripheral vision. So we have three grayscale plots here of an early papilledema a medium papilledema and a late papilledema. So in the early papilledema, we have the enlarged and the blind spot. 
in the medium papilledema, the enlarged, the blind spot, followed by an inferior visual field defect in the particular case, the nasal step I was talking to you about, which as you probably look at it, does actually mimic somebody with an early stage glaucoma. And then we tend to have the overall general constriction of the peripheral vision. And one of the questions people always ask me is what is the best testing strategy for visual fields? And the answer tends to be a normal Humphreys 24-2. We're just checking the peripheral area. That's the first area that's going to be affected after the enlarged with the blind spot. Uh, OCT is now becoming de rigueur in most practices. As I said at the beginning, if you don't have an OCT, don't be concerned. I'll give you plenty of signs and symptoms to take home with you. But OCT now is becoming uh, more common, both in, in hospital and in practice. And we talk it now as being a surrogate marker. Um, so when these young females have been sent to hospital for IIH, one of the diagnoses is a lumbar puncture. And lumbar puncture is an invasive procedure which can have its own complications. So they're now using OCT to manage and measure the ICP in these young females. With the OCT, there tends to be a list of certain parameters we're looking for. And the number one parameter is an increase in the central volume. So you can imagine, again, as a mechanical side effect, the optic nerve has become elevated, the central volume is going to become thicker. Then we tend to have a thickness around the peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer. And then something you may or may not have heard of called a lazy V sign. And a lazy V sign is an older sign, maybe going back to the first generation of OCTs. Now the OCTs technology has advanced. We're now getting better and better images. But I'll talk to you about the lazy V sign. And then more commonly, we're talking about macular ganglion cell as being a, a very, very sensitive area. So some ophthalmologists would look at an optic nerve head and say it's diagnostically difficult. They can't really tell from the optic nerve head. So they may need to go to the macular area. And looking at the macular ganglion cell can be very informative. And we're also looking at the forward bone of Brooks membrane retinal pigment epithelium too as well. So the first one I want to show you was the Brooks membrane retinal pigment epithelium. So this is a normal optic nerve head and the purple teal lines tend to represent the retinal pigment epithelium and the Brooks membrane. This is a pseudopapilledema. So basically the optic nerve head is now swollen. And what tends to happen is you'll tend to find this darker area is fluid, what we refer to as a subretinal hyporeflective space. And the retinal pigment epithelium and the Brooks membrane is now moving upwards. And why is that? It's just due to the pressure of the edema, pressure of the fluid building up within the optic nerve, pushing the retinal pigment epithelium upwards, what we refer to as an inward angulation. I tend to describe it as a bit like a pinball machine and now the flippers are moving upwards. So rather than being parallel, they're linear, they should be moving upwards. That's one of the first signs we're looking for with the papilledema. The lazy V sign, we have an image of a papilledema on the right-hand side, and we have an image of a pseudopapilledema on the left-hand side. In this particular case, it's an optic nerve head drusen. So again, I want to kind of bring your attention to a few things. You'll see in the papilledema, the darker area tends to be quite a smooth internal contour. The darker area in the pseudopapilledema tends to be very irregular and um, not very smooth. What the lazy V sign is a little kind of uh, a gap in between the retinal pigment pigment epithelium and the photoreceptive layer. And it tends to give this kind of V shape. So it's a very smooth area here in comparison to a very abrupt ending of the contour. So that's referred to as the lazy V sign. And some people think it's a very good sign. However, when the OCT data set um, was first been produced for the OCTs, it was mainly Caucasian and usually people over the age of 18. So people didn't really rate it because it couldn't pick up papilledema in children. And that's why some people kind of rate the lazy V sign and some people don't. The macular ganglion cell, as I said, is becoming an awful lot more important now, not just in papilledema, but in glaucoma and also in optic neurosis. When you look at the optic nerve, it's difficult to discern from the optic nerve features. People will go straight away to the macular ganglion cell. So looking at the papilledema, what happens in a macular ganglion cell is you get a thickening superiorly nasally, inferiorly, and it tends to leave the temporal area thinner. So and that's probably one of the things we'll mention quite a bit today in papilledema is the temporal area is always the last area to be affected. So it's always going to be superior, inferior, nasal, or nasal, superior, inferior, followed by the temporal area. So if you're looking at optic nerve head and you look, you feel the temporal area is the area which is uh, elevated, it probably is not because it's always going to be superior, first of all followed by nasal and inferior thickening. So what will tend to happen is you'll tend to find it's thicker, superiorly, nasally, inferiorly, and you have a temporal thinning 
And you'll also tend to find one of the things I found out recently too as well is the magic number to differentiate a papillozema from a pseudopapillozema is 86 microns in the nasal quadrant. So if you're debating whether it's a papillodema or a pseudopapillodema, 86 microns and above would tend to hint towards a papillodema, 86 microns below would tend to indicate a towards a pseudopapillodema. So remember that figure, 86. So for our DOs, our CLOs, our practice managers, some very important information to pass on to you. And papillodema is a condition which is very symptom driven. So if somebody comes into you, sometimes they don't tend to tell the optometrist everything. So if you're the first person who's speaking to a loved one, a partner, a husband, a wife, a parent, a grandparent, and they're expressing their concerns about you know, their, their loved one, they may say things to you such as they're concerned about them, their headaches are getting worse, um, they aren't themselves, they're very lethargic, they're sleeping an awful lot more, the headaches are so severe, they're waking up in the morning time with them, with nausea, vomiting, and these people could have signs of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So weight gain is a very sensitive topic to discuss. Another signs of uh, IIH would tend to be a stiff or sore neck or difficulty in their gait, there's difficulty in the balance. So if anybody's passing this information on to you, please knock on the optometrist door and give the information to the optometrist because the patient may be too embarrassed or may not think it's pertinent or relative to an eye examination. So please pass the information on. It can be, you know, life-saving. So as I said, some conditions are very uh, symptom-led and some are very sign-led. And papillodema tends to be the form. It's very symptom-led. You can really diagnose a papillodema even without doing ophthalmoscopy by doing Vogue, just by the symptoms. And the majority of people are going to have very specific headaches. And those headaches are going to be worse when lying down. The reason being that when they're lying down, you get a buildup of CSF. The, CF, the CSF can't drain. You get therefore get a secondary buildup of intracranial pressure and the headache intensifies. Once they begin to stand up, move around, the CSF can drain, the ICP decreases and the headache gets better. So sometimes people say, yeah, it's very, really bad in the morning time. I wake up in the morning time, really sick, projectile vomiting. Uh, and they'll say it's worse than lying down their back. So sometimes people say, yeah, I sometimes fall asleep with a, a pillow or a cushion behind me because they're afraid to lie down their back because they can be woken with a very severe headache. We also talk about something called a Valsalva maneuver. And a Valsalva maneuver is when they cough or sneeze or shout, they get a buildup inside the brain of pressure and that makes the headache worse. So they may say something like, I'm afraid to sneeze just in case it makes it worse. So when I cough, it makes it really sore. And one of the more important ones I want to bring your attention to is pulsal tinnitus, which is a whooshing sound. So this is a whoosh, whoosh whoosh, synchronous the heartbeat of the pulse. And like a seashell walking on the beach and you pick up a seashell, whoosh, now, this is a very difficult for something for a patient to elicit to you. So they won't give the information voluntarily. You will have to probe for it. So if you get an unremarkable history and symptoms, and then you do ophthalmoscopy evoke and you're concerned, don't prefer to go back and probe and say, have you had that moment where you get that pushing noise in your ear? Like you hang a, you hold a seashell up to you and you get that pushing noise because they won't mention to you because I don't think it's relevant. Something we talk about with papillodema in the clinical papers is a transient visual obscuration. And this is a full field loss of vision, which is only lasts one to two seconds. People may not even be aware of it. So again, you may have to probe for it. And what tends to happen is that the clinical papers call it a graying out or a dimming, but you probably won't hear that in practice. So a very simple question to ask, it needs to be a closed question, a yes or no. Have you ever had momentary loss of vision where it just disappears? And that tends to be quite a good one because if you ask somebody, have you ever had momentary blurry vision where it just goes go funny? You'd probably, most patients would say yes. And it can be an association with eye movements, moving left and right, or getting up from a seated position to a standing position can elicit it too as well. Not to be confused with a loss of vision, which is associated with a visual migraine or a giant cell arthritis or an amaurosis food jacks where you get in uh, five seconds, 10 seconds, 10 minutes, et cetera. This is fleeting in nature, one, two, three seconds. And again, people won't give you that information voluntarily. You will have to probe for it. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any hospital optometrists or dispensing opticians uh, with us this evening time, but you'll tend to find in hospital, they talk about a Frisson scale. And a Frisson scale is a scale going from grade zero to grade five. So if you're on the phone speaking to a hospital ophthalmologist, they may say we had a grade three, sorry, Frisson grade three papilledema or a child with a grade five papilledema. The textbook papers don't tend to talk about Frisson. A couple of reasons. The main reason is it doesn't tend to include the retina. The Frisson scale just talks about the optic nerve head appearance. A lot of people talk with a true papilledema. You'll pick it up on the retina too as well. And also the Frisson scale tends to suffer from intra-observer variation. So what I'm going to talk about in terms of the papilledema is early papilledema, established, chronic, and atrophic. Now, we'd probably all agree these tend to be 
uh, urgent referrals. This is the one which causes the worry, the anxiety, the concern. So with an early papular edema, the patient may be on, on asymptomatic. So routine eye examination, received reminder, broken the glasses, going on holidays, want some new glasses, contact lenses, and they begin to keep saying to you that I've got headaches, a new onset, et cetera. So looking at the optic nerve, it could appear quite normal. The visual symptoms, there may not be. Not be. There could be mild dyskypremia. The this margin may be slightly blurry. I put down here nasal, as in the quadrant that's first affected. People sometimes ask me, which is the first quadrant to be affected? And as I mentioned earlier, it's never temporal. It's either going to be superior, inferior, nasal, or nasal followed by superior and inferior. There may be tortuosity of the vessels and there could be an absence of the SVP and something you may or may not have heard of called a C-shaped halo. And again, a C-shaped halo is very, very distinctive. Once you're shown what it looks like, it's very difficult to forget. So this is the C-shaped halo. So it's a back to front C. And this is what tends to happen with an obscuration and obliteration of the optic nerve head. And again, it happens superiorly, nasally, inferiorly. It doesn't tend to affect the temporal area. So this referred to as a C-shaped halo. Um, you'll tend to find it's also classified as a grade one papillary amount or frisson. So a grade zero frisson would tend to be a very slight elevation on the nasal quadrant. And then a, a frisson grade one would tend to be a C-shaped halo, not including the temporal area. A grade two frisson would be a 360 circumferential obscuration of the optic nerve head margin. And then a grade four would be, sorry, grade three would be, and grade four would be an, uh, an obscuration, a 360 obscuration with mi minor blood vessel involvement and then major blood vessel involvement, et cetera. So that's what they talk about the frisson. So it starts off with this, with a C-shaped halo. Moving into the established papilledema, again, the VAs may be there, they may not be affected. They could have transient visual obscurations. Again, the, if you've got a previous digital retinal camera to compare it against, is the C2D decreasing as it fills with exits? So they get the decrease in the C2D ratio. The optic nerve head margin is going to appear quite angry, quite red as you get the blood vessels, the capillaries bursting. There could be venous engorgement as well as tortuosity. And this we move into the retinal features, which we don't tend to get on the frisson scale. And the retinal features we're talking about here are cotton wool spots, hard exits, and again, something you may or may not have heard of called Peyton's lines. And Peyton's lines, again, is a mechanical side effect of the papilledema. So as the optic nerve tends to become elevated, the retinal area around the optic nerve has to stretch to accommodate that. And that's leave these lines called Peyton's lines. And Peyton's lines tend to be uh, circumferential in nature. And they tend to be seen inferior temporally or superior temporally on the macular side. They tend to be best seen on red free too as well. So you'll tend to find they don't tend to be a normal um, nerve fiber. So to bring you back to your pipe and rapidly anatomy and physiology, the nerve fibers tend to be arcuate in nature and they tend to be more vertical superiorly and inferiorly. They don't tend to have any circuit areas. Uh, so if you see circumferential lines around the optic nerve head, you can see here it's not normal. Uh, so obviously this optic nerve head is going to get um, referred urgently, but you can see here superior temporally and inferior temporally, these patent lines I was referring to, and I said they show up really, really good on red free. Moving on now to the next stage, which is the chronic papilledema. And again, the VAs are going to be variable. Sometimes they may be affected. Sometimes they may not be. The visual field is going to show a constriction. I put down here a champagne cork appearance, and that's the appearance you get, like the top of a mushroom or the top of a champagne cork is going to be quite bulbous, and the disc is going to be paler. And this is where you may or may not get retinal features such as cotton wool spots and hemorrhages. And then we move into the last stage, the atrophic stage. This is very similar to an end stage glaucoma. The optic nerve is going to lose its color. It's going to become that dirty, washed out kind of, you know, grayish color. And the VA is going to be affected. The visual field is going to be affected. But it's good to know that once the, the optic nerve head does go through the different stages, it does return to its normal architecture, but it just loses the, the, the normal yellowy, healthy glow. And you just tend to get this kind of washed out end stage atrophy. So another reason we don't talk about frisson is because of the retinal changes. So when we talk about the retinal change, we're looking for a macular edema, and then we're looking for that macular star. Sometimes papillary edema can be associated with malignant hypertension. So that's another reason why people can sometimes get papillary edema. If their blood pressure is extremely high, you can get a macular star of lipid exits and that kind of firework presentation at the back of the eye. And um, you can also get macular hemorrhages and cotton wool spots. So these are the reasons why people don't really grade or use frisson scale because it doesn't tend to include the retinal features. So we're going to talk about SVP. Uh, I gave this presentation to uh, ophthalmologists, sorry, optometrists across the UK, and I sometimes have asked ophthalmologists and neuro to come on the call with me. And we had five different ophthalmologists, and three of them 
raised his SVP very highly, and the other two who are much younger didn't raise SVP much at all. So you may have been told in college 20, 30, 40 years ago, if they have an SVP, they can't have papilledema, but that's basically not true nowadays. So what the ophthalmologist is trying to find, is, find out if SVP was present and now it's absent, that can be a sign of papilledema. However, when I was in practice, it's, I must admit, it's something I never recorded and looking at other practitioners record keeping is something that they, they never recorded. So maybe we're to blame. We don't record SVP enough to, to say was it there and now it's not. So maybe when you're speaking to your ophthalmologist next time, ask him or her, would you like me to say if SVP is present or absent? And they may say, yes, that's very important to me. Or they may say, no, I don't really rate it much at all. Um, there was a study done by quite a well-known neurologist and neuro-ophthalmologist at a Murfields called Miss Sui Wong. And she was looking at these young females who were referred down to Murfields and they're going to have a lumbar puncture for a suspect IIH. And she was measuring if SVP was present or not. And she found that 86% of them did actually have an SVP. So you can see why some people don't really kind of rate SVP. Some of the older ophthalmologists may think it's very important. Some of the younger ophthalmologists may not rate it, but it is quite a contentious issue. And what is SVP? So it's a spontaneous pulsation of veins in or around the disc, and it's caused by a differential of pressure within the intraocular pressure within the fluid and the pressure within the optic nerve head. So the intraocular pressure is always higher. And then as you get the buildup of pressure with a papilledema, it tends to equalize and you tend to lose that gradient. Um, and obviously, if you can try to apply pressure to the lower part of the eye through the lower eye to try to advocate, try to advocate mild pressure and to see if you can still um, the SVP. So you're going to refer people down to hospital for suspect papilledema. What's the ophthalmologist going to do? And the ophthalmologist is going to start off with least invasive quick tests, and they're going to be the ultrasound tests. So the ultrasound, they do two tests. They do ultrasound A and ultrasound B. Uh, ultrasound A is measuring the diameter of the optic nerve sheath. So just to bring you back to your human anatomy again, so the optic nerve is covered by the optic nerve sheath. And what tends to happen if it has a dematis, it's going to become bigger, larger, wider. So they measure the diameter. It's usually three, four millimeters. If it gets to five or six millimeters, they know it could be a papilledema. The ultrasound B is an extremely sensitive, very, very quick diagnosis of papilledema. So there's a study done, 50 people referred down for suspect papilledema. They're going to have an MRI to see if it was diagnosed. They had an ultrasound B, first of all, at 92% success rate. And they're looking for something called a crescent shape or a crescent sign at the back of the eye when they do ultrasound. And I'll show you that next slide. Sometimes ophthalmologists will admit, even when we do ultrasound, we don't know. Sometimes the optic nerve head is diagnostically difficult. We can't assess the optic nerve properly, and therefore we're going to have to do something else. They're going to do neuroimaging, and that can either be a CAT scan or an MRI scan. They need to do two. One is to check out a, a mass or an abscess or a lesion, a lump, a bump, a space occupying lump, a brain tumor. And they also need to check for uh, bleeding in the brain. So we call it a, a venous sinus thrombosis. So if there's bleeding in the brain, there could be bleeding elsewhere, and that can be fatal too as well. And again, the ophthalmologist will say to you, sometimes I'm still not too sure. What am I going to do then? They'll do fluorescein angiography. And if they do fluorescein angiography, a true papilledema will leak because there's a break into the blood retinal barrier, but a pseudo papilledema won't leak. This is the crescent sign uh, with an ultrasound B. So we have the vitreous cavity, the vitreous humor. And then between the white arrow and the red arrow, we tend to have this crescent sign, horseshoe shaped sign. And that tends to be highly sensitive, just as sensitive as an MRI scan. We do tend to have a bad name for a false positive referral. Um, sometimes we do tend to just kind of err on the side of caution and just refer on safety's sake. And ophthalmologists sometimes tend to give us a bad name. There's two studies here. One is more ad hoc in-house. The other one's a more published study. The in-house was done by a Moorfields ophthalmologist called Jim Aitchison. This was done post Honey Rose case. Over a six month period, 61 kids referred down for suspect papilledema. Only three of them had a papilledema. But the surprising one is here is nearly half of them were asymptomatic. And that's what I was saying to you at the beginning. With papilledema, the majority of people are going to be symptomatic. Even as a child, the parent will be concerned. They aren't themselves. They're holding their head because of headaches. Uh, they, they don't seem to be themselves. The more kind of established study was uh, done in 2019 called the Detection of Papilledema Study, and they compared a community optometrist referral in comparison to hospital optometrist. So they used a 2D digital image, and the optometrist was given a, a forced choice of either papilledema, no papilledema, and the community optometrist had a 21% false positive rate in comparison to the hospital opt optometrist, who is three times better. Now, the figures are a bit skewed because within the hospital optometrist, there were uh, grading photographers, there were also ophthalmologists, 
your ophthalmologist or neurologist. So it does tend to kind of show that a 2D photograph does tend to be quite sensitive, but it can lead to a more rate, higher rate of false positive referrals. So therefore, we're always talking about a stereoscopic 3D view, preferably with a pupil dilation too as well. So we've already discussed papilledema. Now we're going to move into pseudopapilledema. So we established the classical phenotype is a young female, higher than average BMI. So if you have somebody who's asymptomatic, who fits that profile, it can be difficult to judge it. So how you can assess to see could they have possible IIH would be asking questions such as a sore neck, feeling dizzy, trouble walking. And why is this important? Because one of the first things is going to happen when you pick up the phone to speak to your ophthalmologist and send them down, the first thing he or she is going to say is what's the gender and do they have a higher than average BMI because they're screening, they're triaging, could this person be a papilledema? Could this person be IIH? And then talking about using as much of the equipment we have in your practice. So all of our practices are different, but you'll have an OCT, you'll have a DRP, a visual fields, ocular motility, and your previous record card to compare your C to D ratio as well. So just trying to use those as much as possible, what we refer to as a multimodal non-invasive technique. So it's trying to get all the pieces together like a jigsaw to decide if you're going to refer or not. The five main culprits with a pseudopapilledema are optic neuritis, AION, optic nerve head drusen, tilted optic disc, and congenital cryo disc. The two top ones are the least common, and the bottom three are the most common. So we'll get rid of the two top ones first of all, and then we'll concentrate on the three most common reasons. So optic neuritis and AION tend to have a similar presentation in terms of their unilateral in comparison to papilledema, which is bilateral. The optic neuritis and AON tend to be very sudden onset and the loss of vision tends to be very sudden, while the onset in a papilledema tends to be very slow, gradual, or it can be very quick. And the loss of vision, again, tends to be primarily very, very slow, but it can be very quick too as well. The disc swelling with an optic neuritis, some papers say you would get disc swelling in approximately a third of cases with optic neuritis. And with an AION, you're going to definite uh, disc swelling. And then as we've shown, papilledema is going to be marked swelling in both eyes. The visual field defect, again, some papers send, you say you do get a mixed variety of visual field defects with an optic neuritis, a typical hemi-altitudinal visual field defect with an AION, and a papilledema in large blind spot followed by an inferior visual field defect followed by a general constriction. And then pupillary involvement, you'll get a definite diagnosis of an optic neuritis in the AION just by looking for an RAPD, where you may not get an RAPD until late stage papilledema. So the number one reason we get it wrong with optic, uh, sorry, with papilledema is optic nerve head drusen. So this is the reason we get it wrong in three quarters of the cases. And that's why ophthalmologists don't like us referring people down because three quarters of the time you get it wrong. And why? Because of optic nerve head drusen. Now, as we mentioned at the beginning, there could be a broad church of people here. And depending on your experience, if you're newly qualified or pre-reg, you're qualified quite a lot of years, or if you're in a high volume practice or low volume practice, you'll come across optic nerve head juice in quite a lot. So the majority of times it's bilateral, nasal more so than temporal, congenital, Caucasians affected more than anybody else. With enhanced depth imaging, I'm not sure if you've seen these images, but they do tend to pick up the optic nerve head juice and as they become closer to the optical surface, and it can be easier to detect in comparison to maybe the first generation OCTs. And as the OCT technology improves, we'll probably get the same level of technology that the hospitals have. We'll have hospital grade OCT and the high street. So there's two different types of optic nerve head juice, and we talk about visible, which is on the optic nerve head surface, and we talk about hidden or buried. And the hidden or buried ones are congenital, and they take 20 or 30 years before they migrate to the top of the optical, optical nerve, nerve head and become visible. And during that 20 or 30 years, they alter the structure of the retinal nerve fiber layer, layers, and that mimics op, uh, visual field defect. It tends to be a mimicker of glaucoma. It can sometimes lead to TVOs. You can sometimes get very small hemorrhages on the top of the optic nerve at 11 o'clock and one o'clock small little pools of blood, uh, but very rare. And one of the kind of the amazing things, which again, once is pointed out to you, it's very, very easy to watch out for is anomalous branch in the blood vessels. And this can be quite a very easy clue to look for. If you're thinking, is it a papilledema? Is it a pseudopapilledema? Look at anomalous branching, and that's going to demonstrate next. So the nomenclature for an optic nerve head drusen tends to be interchangeable with a drusenoid disc. So if you're speaking to an ophthalmologist or optometrist in the hospital, they may use the terms interchangeably, drusenoid disc, optic nerve head drusen. Moth-eaten tends to be a term that affects approximately a third of people with optic nerve head drusen. We get atrophy on the optic nerve head margin, and that can just be seen as a hyper or hypo area here. So the two images, the one on the left-hand side is a bit more easier, the one on the right-hand side is a bit more complex. 
And we're talking about drusen, not to be confused with macular drusen, but drusen would tend to be hard, calcified, hyaline, circular bodies. And they take the word from the German word from rock. So drusen is rock. And what we're looking for is blood vessels which tend to deflect at 90 degrees. So if you look at this blood vessel here, it's going along its natural course, and all of a sudden, boom, it changes direction by 90 degrees. Why? Because it can't go through the rock. It's got to change its course. So that's what we're talking about, this anomalous branching. So something's gone wrong with this branch of the blood vessel, and it's got to change direction. In the second image on the right hand side, we have a large drusen at the one o'clock position. And you can see the blood vessel here has to alter its course. It doesn't deflect, it bifurcates. So you get a bifurcation of the blood vessel before it leaves the optic nerve head margin. And again, that wouldn't be normal and that should raise suspicion. And if you're looking at blood vessels, the blood vessel should always be on top of the optic nerve head margin. If the blood vessel is on top of the optic nerve head margin, it should be a pseudo papilledema. If the optic nerve head margin is on top of the blood vessel, then that would be a papilledema. But again, just spend that extra minute if you have and just look at anomalous branching such as a bifurcation or a change in direction of the blood vessel. So you're going to send the person down to hospital for suspect papilledema. What are they going to do that we can't do to see is it a, a papilledema or a suspect papilledema? They're going to check for opacification. They're going to check for hyperreflectivity. So with an optic nerve head drusen, it'll glow or glisten uh, on a ultrasound B. I'm not sure if anybody has an Optomap or Optos, but it just tends to be like putting on Christmas tree lights at Christmas time, turn the lights on, they just tend to glow. And that's because the calcium within the, the optic nerve head drusen, they just tend to glisten like our calcium in our bone we have an x-ray. The second most common reason we get it wrong is tilted optic disc, uh, bilateral tilted disc syndrome. And again, if you're in a high volume practice or low volume practice, you'll come across this quite a lot more in from myopic population. And it just tends to be a slightly more obliquely inserted optic nerve head. And that tends to lead to a nasal elevation of the optic nerve head margin and the temporal area appears to be more depressed or further away. So we get this elevated area. And again, if you're not too sure and you get concerned, think about what should be happening with a papilledema. So we're looking at this optic nerve head it looks elevated here it looks further away here and we're thinking that's surprising that's getting me confused look at the things you should be associating with the papilledema such as c-shaped halo is there a c-shaped halo no is there a sign to patent's lines no we know there's a decrease in the c to d ratio that c to d ratio looks quite reassuring it's quite big the optic nerve head should be quite and look hyperemic it should look quite angry there should, should be hemorrhages are there any signs of those are there any obscuration of the blood vessels again just going through your mind a mental checklist of what should i be looking for and the third most common reason is a congenital crowded disc. And again, more in our hyperopes rather than our myopes. And it tends to just be a smaller disc, which looks a bit more red or a bit more hyperemic, a bit more angry with either a smaller or an absent C to D raised to slightly blurry margins. And we get confused. And we spoke to Scottish optometrists and they said, well, they measure the optic nerve head quite routinely. And I said, sorry, what, what do you mean? It's on a normal practice. Oh, in a glaucoma screening, they'd measure the optic nerve head vertically and horizontally. And if they were concerned, if it was a papilledema or pseudopapilledema, they'd measure the optic nerve head parameters and get the person to come back then a week later, two weeks later and repeat them again. So you can see here with the superior nasal and inferior nasal margin, it just tends to appear incomplete. The margins appear a bit more blurry. The optic nerve head appears a bit more redder, a bit more hyperemic. We have an absent or loss of a CTD ratio. And you'll just tend to find, again, you get suspicious. But think of, is there a C-shaped halo? Is there patent lines? Can we see that blood vessel cross in the optic nerve head margin as we said around crystal clear? That's a crystal clear blood vessel all the way through. Is there any signs of obscuration? And the answer is no. So again, going back to the differential diagnosis between this papilledema and a pseudopapilledema, the hospital will use ultrasound B looking for an echogenic reflection, looking for hyperreflectivity. So a, a optic nerve head drusen will tend to show high reflectivity and a normal optic nerve head will show low reflectivity. Um, so we talk about fundus autofluorescence photographs too as well. And this is something that wasn't available in the high street a couple of years ago, but now is readily available. And this is how we can see optic nerve head drusen um, in a more different light. It's not, it can't be used to pick up buried optic nerve head juice, but it can show up optic nerve head juice and as they're quite close to the surface. And it can be, again, a great game changer just in case you are being kind of sending people down. You're not too sure if it's an optic nerve head juice or a papilledema. So what can we do in practice? Uh, as we're probably aware with OCT, OCT can sometimes throw a few kind of curveballs at us and say something's, excuse me, abnormal when it's not. 
Uh, and the reason being that the European uh, data set tends to be Caucasian Europeans uh, over the age of 18. Now, it is changing. Now, the data set is including children, but sometimes people, kind of, the OCT will say there's something wrong. We will refer to it as a red disease. So if you're not too sure and the OCT is saying there's warning, warning, something's not right, get the person to come back and repeat your measurements. Use your patient as a control and get them to come back and repeat the OCT as well as your DRP and your visual fields and use them as your, your control. And again, going back to the DOs and the CLOs, the practice managers, so the importance of kind of, you know, digital imaging going into the practice and going into the optometrist room is very, very important because it will guide the optometrist whether a referral is required or not. And so if you have poor information going in, it may put the optometrist under pressure to kind of think, well, that looks a bit suspect. I might need to refer that. Also, with uh, the advent of telehealth and telemedicine, we're now sharing images both internally and externally with other people. So please make sure the images attached do at fit the right person so you do want to make sure that you got the wrong image with the wrong person and making sure that the rest of the team in your practice are aware of the importance of the good screening so decreasing artifacts as much as possible so on OCT get your team to get the patient to stop their blinking momentarily uh, when they're doing the digital retinal camera try to decrease ambient illumination by bringing your curtain across sometimes people with small pupils older population or you might have uh, lenticular opacities might tend to just throw shadows on the images so all these can help the optometrist if they don't have poor images and then also visual fields tends to kind of be a personal bugbear people just get are given the kind of the button and say push that and then you get off of visual fields and you go back and do it yourself just engage the patient and say yeah you're doing really good or no you're not getting the hang of this let's go back and try it again or let's stop there and sometimes older people tend to take more time sometimes cognitive uh, mental hearing aid people with busy kids you know everyone's different but we're all human at the end of the day and we make mistakes. And in a busy clinic, you could be running behind the, the managers who squeezed in another kind of patient for you. Have somebody present with a red eye, somebody broken the glasses and something's a problem. You've missed your lunch and it can be quite difficult. And, you know, so don't give out to people. Just kind of case of help people out and just kind of point to the out to them did you see that red eye did you see the kind of bleed at the back of the eye did you see that kind of um optic nerve or did it look a bit suspicious to you what do you think that visual field defect was because we're there to help each other um and the people doing the screening can be a wealth of information so they spend five minutes ten minutes with them before they meet the optometrist and they can say that person's a good responder they're very nervous they're very anxious they're not giving much away so it can give you a lot of information before you meet them so trying to get a good rapport going with the people who are doing the screening if you're not doing the screening yourself and then the importance of staff training uh, to make sure that the staff are aware of the importance of a good screening which will move on to the optometrist then making that decision whether to bring the patient back for it to be repeated or have a good one the first time around so the importance of having digital retinal cameras to compare with uh, past and previous, uh, so this was shared by a Scottish optometrist, talked about a pre-papilledema and a papilledema. So you can see the C to D ratio is quite large there in the pre-papilledema, and then it tends to decrease. We have the very obvious C-shaped halo, uh, apart from the temporal area, and then it does tend to get 360 circumferential. So now moving into the nitty gritty, how do we differentiate a distrusion from a papilledema? So with an optic nerve head drusen, would be visual symptoms? Not really. With a papilledema, you may be anticipated getting TVOs. With the visual field, would you get optic nerve head drusen? Not really. Sometimes it can be an, a nasal step to mimic a glaucoma. With a papilledema, we've already established in a large blind spot, followed by an inferior visual field defect, followed by general constriction. Would you get double vision? With an optic nerve head drusen, no. You could get a cranial nerve six pulse with a papilledema. Would you get headaches as a new presentation with optic nerve head drusen? Maybe, but the headaches with a papilledema would tend to be worse when lying down, pulsatile tinnitus, projectile vomiting, um, worse when moving, from, getting it better from moving from a, a lying down position to a seated position, and worse with Valsalva maneuvers. And then the optic nerve appears elevated or swollen in both. Uh, but you look at the retinal features. Would you get retinal features with an optic nerve head drusen? And the answer is no. With a papilledema, you'd be intent anticipating patent lines, cotton wool spots, macular hemorrhages, macular edema. And this is probably the most important slide of the presentation. And this is the one that people kind of always ask me for. And to, to make sure you understand, so if you do look at an optic nerve and you're concerned and you're thinking, is this a papilledema or a pseudopapilledema? There's one thing which will be in common to both. They'll both appear elevated. 
But if you step back for a moment and just think, what should else, what else, what are the characteristics of the optic nerve head should I be looking for? So with the, the optic nerve head, the color in a pseudopapilledema is going to be a normal orangey, healthy glow. And a papilledema is going to be very angry. It's going to be a red, beefy, hyperemic appearance. The disc margins in a pseudopapilledema are going to be normal. They're going to be distinct. They're going to be sharp. In a papilledema, they're going to be very smudgy, blurry, marshmallowy. And a C to D ratio in a pseudopapilledema is going to be the same as it was previous time, if you've got a previous record to compare it against, or it could be slightly smaller with a crowded disc. And a papilledema is going to be decreasing or absent. We've already discussed the contentious issue of SVP. Some people like it, some people don't. With a papilledema, you would get hemorrhages peripapillary and also off disc. With a pseudopapilledema, very, very rare would you get a, um, hemorrhages, maybe occasionally, as I mentioned, top at the 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock position. And would you get retinal features with a pseudopapilledema, such as cotton wool spots, exudates, macular edema? No, but you would get those with a papilledema. So just spend that extra minute thinking, when you look inside somebody's eye and you're thinking, oh my God, that's a papilledema. Just spend one moment and just kind of think, okay, what am I looking at? And then more importantly, symptoms. Is the patient symptomatic? Yes, no. So just coming towards the end of the presentation, guys, just some things to watch out for. So headaches, does the patient have headaches that are worse when lying down, but get better when they stand up? Uh, the pulsatile tinnitus is very important. Okay, and how do you ask that? Do you have that momentary ringing in your ear, like when you have that seashell walking on the beach? And they may say yes or no. The TVOs, they won't mention the word graying out. They won't mention the word dimming. Very, very specific, closed question. Have you ever had that moment where your vision just disappears? And then to bring the person back if you can. So remember, if the patient is asymptomatic, if you can bring them back, give the clinical capacity and the confidence to bring them back five days, 10 days later and do your checks again. Don't panic. Uh, don't be afraid to call the on-call ophthalmologist in your local area for advice. Uh, we're probably all on WhatsApp groups, whether it be with uh, your own company or the own practice you're with or outside of your, your company with friends and colleagues. Um, and remember, the NHS is available 24-7. So if you're working in a practice that's open late on a Thursday night till 7 o'clock, half past 7, or working in a shopping centre that's open late every night, don't be afraid to send the person down to the hospital. Let the on-call ophthalmologist be the judge and jury decide what needs to be done. We have a duty of care to look after our patients at all times. And then 90% of papilledema will be symptomatic, only 10% will be asymptomatic. And we all have the College of uh, Optometrist uh, app on our phone, and the urgent referral is 24 to 48 hours. So hopefully you've enjoyed that, guys. That's my name and my email address. So in case anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Some people prefer open forums. People prefer closed forums. So if you do want to email me, uh, please feel free. Uh, I work with the Brain Tumor Charity. That's the web address at the bottom. So if you do have anybody in your practice, whether it be a colleague, a friend, a work mate, or even just a, a, a customer who would like to be signposted to a website, which gives information, wonderful resources on how to deal with the brain tumor, please feel free.